Hello, this is an introductory video to help you understand the collisions lab that you are going to do in Phys 1104. If you're doing this in the fall of 2020, when you can't do the labs in the physical lab space, then this is standing in place of the introduction that your lab instructor would normally give to you at the beginning of the lab period. If you're doing this in other years, you may still find this to be a useful set of videos. Before we get into this lab, I actually want to take just a moment to talk about why we even do labs in science courses. Here are a bunch of reasons that are often stated for doing labs. Let's look at them. This first one is often stated as a reason, but there's actually some good evidence to show that labs are not very effective, at least in intro physics courses, at improving students' understanding of the theoretical course content. So that's actually not what I've designed these labs for. I always think this second reason isn't much of a reason. If you're really skeptical and doubt that the theory works, one lab is unlikely to convince you, especially given that undergraduate labs are usually pretty crude and often seem to show that the theory doesn't work. This one, developing report writing skills, is a really good reason to do labs. But you'll notice in this course that we're not having you write formal reports. So this is something that your upper year labs are more likely to be about. And so that leaves these. And these are the main focuses of labs in 1104. If you're doing this in the fall of 2020 and you're doing these labs at home, then the measurement techniques aspect will be a little de-emphasized and we'll be focusing more on the second two. Part of the point of these goals of measurement techniques, data analysis, and uncertainty analysis is to understand how we apply our rather idealized theoretical ideas about the world to more realistic situations. So to understand the sort of complicated interplay of ideas that are at work in this lab, I think it's going to be useful to go from an idealized picture to a picture that's closer to what you'll actually see in your data. So here's what a collision experiment would look like in an ideal world. And what, do I, what I mean by an ideal world is one where there's no measurement uncertainty. For some reason, we can do infinitely precise measurements. And there's no friction. So what we have here is our two carts, and they're going at constant velocity before the collision. The collision occurs, and then they're going at two new constant velocities after the collision. And analyzing this would be really easy. We could just read the initial velocities off from any time before the collision, read the final velocities off from any time after, and then check momentum conservation. Here's what our data would look like in a somewhat less idealized world, but still not the world we live in. This is a world where there's still no friction, but where measurements are realistic and have some uncertainty associated with them. So if we tried the trick from before of just reading off any pair of initial velocities and any pair of final velocities, we would expect to find that momentum wasn't conserved because the uncertainty will cause our values to be different from the true underlying values. So now we need to do some statistics. We would take a range of velocities before the collisions and use them to calculate momentums at a lot of different times and use those to get a best estimate and an uncertainty of the momentum before. And we would do all the same thing for the momentum after. And now we would compare them to see whether they agree within uncertainty. Now, here's what we actually expect our data to look like in the real world, both with measurement uncertainty and with friction. Notice these lines through the velocities are not horizontal because friction is slowing the carts down. So think about what would happen if you calculated the average momentum after the collision using all of the data available from after the collision. You're going to be calculating an average of something that has a decreasing trend. Maybe it's now obvious to you why the friction is going to cause us such a big problem in this experiment, even though the friction is weak. But if it's not obvious, here's a simpler example which might make it clearer. So imagine we want to know your height. And here's some data we have on your height from the time you were 2 until the time you were 19. And we want to know your height now. 
well, you know, we could just take this data, average over all of it, get a best estimate and an uncertainty, and off we go. And if you put that point and its error bars onto the chart, there it is. Does this seem reasonable as a way of getting your current height? I hope you can see that this is ridiculous. We've included data in the average that isn't representative of the thing that we're trying to measure. We're trying to measure your current height, but your height when you were two, three, or four is not representative of your current height, and so we shouldn't have included it in the average. By doing so, we've made the mean a very poor estimate of the true value of the thing we actually want to know, and we've artificially increased the uncertainty, because the uncertainty we're seeing is not just from measurement uncertainty, but from the fact that the underlying thing we're measuring has actually changed. So that's no good. What we should have done in this case is use just the last bit of data where your height seems to be roughly constant, and get a best estimate and an uncertainty from that. However, think of the carts. There is no time when we expect the friction to not be acting, and so we don't have a nice convenient time in the cart data where the velocities are expected to actually be constant. So hopefully you're now seeing the problem. What we're really interested in is the momentum just before the collision and the momentum just after the collision, and in an ideal world we would expect them to be equal. However, we have to calculate our momentum using velocities from a time period after the collision. The longer time period we use, the more we're going to get this effect of the trend causing our mean to be a poor estimate and our uncertainties to be too large. Also, when we use a big run of data, the time that the average will up actually represent will be somewhere in the middle of that time. So all we can actually do is get an estimate of the momentum at some tf somewhat after the collision, an estimate of the momentum at some ti somewhat before the collision, so there's some difference in time between them, and the friction is acting on the system for that whole time delta t. So there are a lot of ideas here, and I'm sort of hinting at a lot of things and hoping that your underlying understanding of what's going on in the, in the experiment is sufficient that you see what's going on. But let's check. Let's help you out and check your understanding. So when two carts roll along a track and collide, we expect that we'll observe the momentum of the system to change. Why do we expect the momentum to change? Here are some possibilities. 